This is Jake Andrews. Two weeks ago, he completed the sixth grade and made the honor roll. Two days ago, he presented to the ER with an acute appendicitis. Two hours later, we almost lost him. What nearly killed Jake was not his appendicitis. Instead, it was a rare but potentially deadly condition called malignant hyperthermia. Can I help you all? Yes, my son's having abdominal pain and we need to see a doctor. Okay, please fill this out for me and we'll get him back to a room. Okay. Over the course of this video, you'll learn how dangerous MH is how to recognize the warning signs, and how to react when MH strikes. You'll learn the steps to take before, during, and after surgery to minimize and treat MH, and you'll learn where to turn if you need more help. But most importantly, you'll learn why Jake is still with us. Ma'am, please sign this consent form for treatment. And Jake, I'm going to put your ID bracelet on your wrist, OK? okay. Tell me where you're hurting. Right here. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst imaginable pain, what would you give your pain right now? Probably a 7. Are you going to give me a shot? No, nope, just checking your blood pressure right now. How long has this been going on? Since last night. Have you had any vomiting with it? Yes. When's the last time you had something to eat or drink? Last night at dinner. Okay. Jake, I'm gonna leave you alone for a minute and have you put this gown on. Leave the opening in the back. Your nurse today is gonna be Maureen and she'll be right in to see you. Okay. Hi, Jake. Hi, Mom. My name is Maureen. I'm going to be your nurse. I understand your belly's been hurting, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a few things I need to do before the doctor sees you, and one of them's going to be an IV. Have you ever had one before? No. No? Okay. Well, it's going to be a little stick at first. It's going to burn a little, and then there's going to be a little bit of pain, but then that'll be it. If you hold real still, it'll be over quickly. Malignant hyperthermia is a hypermetabolic crisis usually triggered by certain inhalation agents and succinylcholine, normally used for anesthesia during surgery. Okay, ready? It's going to be a stick. It can also be triggered in rare cases by exercise or heat stroke, but virtually all cases occur during the perioperative period. MH can manifest either during or after surgery. It can appear up to two hours after administration of anesthesia. So it's important to be watchful, both in the OR and in PACU. And you're all set. I'll send Dr. Roche in to see you. Okay, I'll see you in a few. Hey Jake, I'm Dr. Roche. Mom, how are you? I'm good. I'm gonna take a look and we're gonna see what's going on with your tummy today, okay? Okay. Um, Jake, pretty healthy? Has any yeah, he's always been very healthy. He's never had any issues. This all started about two days ago when he complained of being really nauseated. Okay. Has he had any fever at all? Not at home, but I think when we got him here today, he did have a tent. Okay. All right. Um, is Jake on any medicines? At None all? at all. No? Any allergies to medicines? Not to my knowledge. No? Okay. And I'm assuming Jake hasn't had any surgeries? Or no. Okay, great. Hasn't. Well, Jake, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of lift up your shirt and we'll take a feel for your tummy here real quick, okay? All right. Now, does it hurt for me to push mm -hmm. in through here at all? No? That doesn't bother you much. Okay. How about on that side there? No. Okay. And then... Yeah. That hurts right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does it hurt for me to tap on you on that side? No. Okay. And then how about when I tap here? That definitely yeah. irritates you, huh? Now I'm gonna ask you a question, okay? I'm gonna push right on that spot here for a second. Does it hurt worse when I push in or when I let go? Push in. When I push in, okay. All right, well, um, you know, Jake's definitely got some symptoms and some findings that make me concerned for appendicitis. 
So I think we definitely need to run some blood work that the nurse got earlier, okay. uh, urinalysis and a CAT scan so we can take a look and make sure. And the CAT scan allows us to see everything on the inside so okay. we can take a look. Okay. okay. Okay, Jake, do you have any other questions for me at all? No. No? Okay. Mom? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and step out and we'll get those things ordered and we'll go from there. Okay. okay. Thank okay, you. Great. As many as 1 in 50,000 adults and 1 in 15,000 children may be susceptible for MH. Hey, Jake. How are you? My name is Reagan. I'm from radiology. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take you for a CT today. Can you tell me what you're Although incidence here? rates vary greatly by region of the country and by nationality. In some areas, MH reactions may occur in as many as 1 in 3,000 to 5,000 administrations of general anesthesia. Both sexes and all ages are susceptible, although MH is more common in males. Well, Jake, it looks like the CAT scan confirms my diagnosis of appendicitis. Your white blood cell count was about 12,000 and you had a low grade temperature. So Dr. Daniel is here to talk to you about the surgery, okay? Hi, Jake, Dr. O'Daniel. Operating room's getting ready. We're gonna get you back there in a few minutes to get that appendix out. We're gonna do it with a laparoscope, which means we're gonna make a few small incisions around your tummy, look in with our lighted scope, find your appendix and take it out. Bad news, good news. Bad news is you're not gonna have very big scars. The good news is you'll be back playing your video games tomorrow before you know it. We're going to get you back in just a few minutes and get that taken care of. Do you have any questions for me, Jake, Mom? No. All right, I have one last question for you. When was the last time you had anything to eat or drink? Last night, but I vomited it up. All right, well, they're going to come back and get you in a few minutes. Before we go back, I need to mark your tummy, okay? When MH occurs, the skeletal muscles begin releasing abnormal levels of calcium at the cellular level. This leads to sustained muscle contraction and to huge increases in metabolism and heat production. Typically, N-tidal CO2 increases to twice or three times the normal levels. If left unchecked, MH quickly leads to rhabdomyolysis or muscle breakdown. As muscle cells die off, potassium is released, potentially leading to hyperkalemia and ventricular arrhythmias. In addition, the muscle protein myoglobin is released, potentially causing acute renal failure. Other outcomes can include DIC, internal hemorrhaging, brain injury, liver failure, and death. In 1960, the MH mortality rate was as high as 70%. With the introduction of dantrolene in 1979, the rate dropped significantly. Fortunately, today, the mortality rate is 5% or less. MH awareness begins in pre-op, where the anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist asks some very specific questions. Hi. How are you? All right. How are you doing, Jake? Good. I'm Dr. Morris, one of the anesthesiologists, okay? I need to ask your mom a few questions, so just bear with me, okay? All right. Ms. Andrews, has Jake ever been put to sleep before for surgery? Not at all. To your knowledge, do you have any uh, relatives that have had any trouble with anesthesia, specifically high fevers with anesthesia? No. Uh, does Jake have any trouble with his heart, lungs, liver, kidney, or stomach? Before this, he's always been perfectly healthy. Okay, good. Uh, he's not a diabetic? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any uh, routine medicines he's taking? No, he doesn't take anything. And he's not allergic to any medicines as far as you know? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And when's the last time he ate or drank anything? Uh, dinner last night, but he vomited after he ate and he hasn't had anything since. Okay. So uh, he's essentially never been in the hospital? No, he's always been very healthy since birth is the only time he's been in the hospital when he was born. Okay, well, good. Jake, open your mouth real wide for me. All right. Uh, no caps or crowns or loose teeth at all? No. And he's not allergic to anything as far as you know of? Not to my knowledge. Okay, good. Jake, we're going to get you ready for surgery. I want to remind you again that nothing's going to hurt you, okay? No needle sticks. Everything I do, I'll tell you about, okay? Okay. All right, and we're going to give you a little relaxation medicine now and get you ready for surgery, okay? Okay. Okay. Patty, would you give him one milligram IV Versed? One milligram IV Versed. Correct. Okay, pal. I'll see you in a little bit, okay? okay. 
Since MH is a dominantly inherited disorder, family history is a key indicator. Half the children and siblings of individuals with MH susceptibility are likely to be susceptible as well. However, someone who is MH susceptible may never know he carries a genetic defect for MH. In fact, half the patients who experience MH incidents have previously undergone anesthesia using MH triggering agents and experienced no problems. We're ready for Dr. Morris. Okay. Can you ask Dr. Morris to come to OR3? Thanks. It's critical then that OR personnel plan for the possibility of an MH incident. That means understanding MH, training for MH crisis, and having an MH cart stocked and readily available near the OR. Fortunately for Jake, all those elements are in place in this hospital. Jake, how are you doing? Good. You ready to take a little nap? All right. Some of the medicine I give you may kind of tingle your uh, left hand and arm, okay? Don't let that worry you. Nothing's gonna hurt, okay? And there are gonna be no needle sticks. Everything I do, I'll tell you about, okay? Okay. All right, this may tingle a little bit, okay? Have a good nap. Jake, where do you go to school? Good what grade are you in? We got him. Can you ventilate? Good ventilation. All right, sounds good. Okay. Laura, you need anything else? No, thanks, I'm good. Okay. Good morning. I'm good. Thank you. Trip dry. Is table good for you? Table's good. Thank you. Okay, let's take our time out. This is Jake Andrews. He's here for Dr. O'Daniel to do a laparoscopic appendectomy. The abdomen is marked. The patient has no allergies. Are we ready to proceed? Yes. All right. As the term malignant hyperthermia implies, elevated body temperature is central to MH. It is not, however, typically the first clinical manifestation. The most consistent indicator is an unexpected increase in end tidal CO2, reaching as high as two to three times its normal level when minute ventilation remains constant. This increase may occur quickly or over a long period of time. Another specific sign is body rigidity, which can include masseter muscle spasm. Other common signs are tachycardia, hypertension, hypercardia, and PVCs. Later signs include severe hyperthermia, with core temperatures sometimes exceeding 44 degrees centigrade, and uncontrolled hypermetabolism. Skin temperature is not a reliable indicator of hypermetabolism. 
Instead, core temperature should be monitored. Okay, we're getting finished up here. Let's get the trocars out. Dr. O'Daniel, our temperature and our heart rate and in tidal CO2 are up. I think we might be having an MH crisis. All right, well, let me get closed up here real quick. Diana, can you get Dr. Morrison here stat, please? We need Dr. Morrison OR3 stat. Thanks. All right, well, I'm done. I'm going to go out and talk to the family and tell them what's going on. I'll be outside if you need me. Okay. Dr. Morse is on his way. All right, thank you. Laura, what's going on? Dr. Morris, I think we might be having an MH crisis. My heart rate's up to 160, my temperature's up to 40, and my end tidal CO2 is 70. Okay. Jaw muscles do appear rigid. Have you given much narcotics? I just redosed it, and I think he's, he's adequate on that, but he still continues to climb on his CO2 and his heart rate. Okay, I agree with you. I think we're in an MH crisis. Diana, will you go ahead and get the MH cart? Additional OR personnel and page Dr. Cotton back here stat. Okay. We have an MH crisis in OR3. Can you page Dr. Cotton to come to OR3 stat? Can somebody bring me the MH cart, the crash cart, and send some extra personnel to help us out? Laura, will you go ahead and start a peripheral IV? Sure. I'll get an A line started. Yes. And I've got the agent off and I've got my oxygen up. Okay. Will you go ahead and place a Foley? Sure. So long. Dr. Cotton, we're having an MH crisis. I need you to draw some labs. Better get this A line in. I need you to draw a CBC, a BMP, a calcium, a CK, and coags. And go ahead and send a urine uh, for urine myoglobin. I need you to get some ice and some chilled fluid so we can cool them down. Okay. All right, I need two people reconstituting Rivanto. Based on his weight, I need 100 milligrams or five vials. To remind you again, I need 60 cc's of sterile water with each vial. Great, you got the ice. I need you to put some around his axilla, his head, his chest, and his abdomen and legs. And I need you to go ahead and start a bladder lavage with sterile saline. And I need you to put an NG in. Okay. Get these to the lab, stat. First bottle of Rivanto is ready, 20 milligrams. Great, let's get it injected. Diana, can you go ahead and call the ICU and tell them we'll need a bed? I'll call them. And here's the rest of the five vials, 20 milligrams each. Let's make it here. Can somebody check my labs for me? Sure. Temperature, heart rate, and end tidal are still elevated. Let's do an additional round of Rivanto. It's been five minutes. Here's your second dose of Rivanto. Thanks. Labs are back. Great, let's see what we've got. As you would expect, the patient's in metabolic acidosis. The calcium's elevated. Dr. Cotton, let's go ahead and give him an amp of bicarb, some insulin, and some D50. Here's the bicarb and D50. I've got your insulin. Let's go ahead and give him 20 milligrams of Lasix to help protect the kidneys. Do you have the D50? Yeah. 
Here's your Lysix. Doing that now. Temperature, heart rate, and end title are still elevated. Let's do an additional round of Revanto. It's been five minutes. Here's your third dose of Revanto. All right, thank you. Temperature is starting to come back down. He's at 38.7. When he reaches 38, we'll discontinue the cooling process. It's been five minutes. Let's give our last dose of Revanto. Here's the last dose of Revanto. Thank you. Let's get it injected. Doing that now. Temperature, heart rate, and entitle are almost back to normal limits. Let's go ahead and get rid of the ice packs and get him ready to transport to PACU. Great job, everybody, with dealing with this MH crisis. Y'all really function as a team. All right, thanks. Successfully managing an MH crisis requires speed and teamwork. The tasks are many and the time is short. Let's walk through the role each health professional should play. OR personnel play specific roles during an MH crisis. Many things must happen quickly, so having adequate personnel is of utmost importance. The first step in dealing with an MH crisis is to stop the triggering agents. The surgeon, therefore, must quickly stabilize the patient and decide whether to abort the procedure or to continue. In Jake's case, the surgeon had already completed the appendectomy. Therefore, he closes the incision and stands by ready to assist if needed. The anesthesiologist directs other team members in dealing with the crisis. The CRNA or anesthesiologist discontinues all potential triggering agents and hyperventilates the patient with 100% oxygen. In addition, they monitor the patient's routine vital signs. The CRNA or anesthesiologist inserts an arterial line to monitor blood pressure and send off labs and ABGs. In addition, they will watch for signs and symptoms of DIC. Inserts a second peripheral IV for Revanto and other drugs after the crisis starts. Monitors urine color for signs of myoglobinuria. This requires inserting a Foley catheter. Monitors for possible signs of DIC puts in NG for gastric lavage, puts in rectal probe if necessary, administers sodium bicarbonate to treat metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia, Lasix to protect the kidneys, glucose and insulin to treat hyperkalemia, and lidocaine to treat dysrhythmias. Note, however, that dysrhythmias may resolve naturally once hyperkalemia and acidosis are corrected. The CRNA or anesthesiologist should also document medications and dosages, as well as cooling measures and time. The circulating nurse pages the anesthesiologist and additional personnel to the OR, communicates with the lab technicians for all lab work, alerts the PACU and ICU to be prepared to receive the MH patient, puts in Foley catheter, gets all supplies for MDA and CRNA. Supplies are kept in a dedicated MH cart. The dantrolene nurse brings the MH cart into the OR and immediately begins reconstituting Revanto. The MH cart should contain 36 vials of dantrolene sodium for injection along with the supplies necessary to reconstitute and administer it. Previous versions of dantrolene could take up to three minutes to reconstitute. Revanto completely reconstitutes in just 20 seconds or until solution is clear. Each vial of Revanto should be reconstituted with 60 milliliters of non-bacteriostatic sterile water. Shake the vial for 20 seconds or until the solution is clear. 
The initial dosage of Revanto is 2.5 milligrams per one kilogram of body weight. For a 41 kilogram patient like Jake, we chose 2.5 milligrams per kilogram. At least five vials would be administered. However, administration should continue until end tidal CO2 and temperature begins to drop. You're going to repeat it every five to 10 minutes. More may be needed if symptoms persist. For our example, this patient was given 2.5 milligrams per one kilogram as an initial dose of Revanto. And once again, this can be repeated every five minutes toward a total dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram. More Revanto may be administered if symptoms persist. Having additional personnel on hand will enable the Dantrolene nurse to quickly reconstitute enough Revanto. The cooling nurse's job is to ensure adequate bags of ice are available. The quickest action is to bring in bags of ice and place them at the patient's head, axilla, chest, abdomen, and legs. The stomach, bladder, and rectum can also be irrigated with cold saline as can the peritoneal cavity if it is opened. A cooling blanket can also be used, and the ambient temperature in the room can be reduced. Cooling measures should be stopped once the core temperature drops to 38 degrees centigrade or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The body will continue to cool naturally, especially when MH crisis is reversed. A dedicated drawer in the MH cart contains the supplies the cooling nurse needs to irrigate the patient. As you've seen, the MH cart is essential to the successful management of an MH crisis. It includes four separate drawers, each dedicated to a separate function. The first drawer contains supplies including lab supplies, lines, urine specimen kits, and documentation materials. The second drawer contains 36 vials of Revanto, along with the syringes and other supplies needed to reconstitute and administer the drug. Drawer 3 contains the medications needed to treat the side effects of MH. These include sodium bicarbonate, furosemide, dextrose, calcium chloride, insulin, and lidocaine. Finally, drawer 4 contains supplies for cooling the patient, including a Foley catheter, rectal and NG tubes, an irrigation tray, Tumi syringes, and bags for ice packs. M-House can provide complete information on what the cart should contain, as well as a poster to be affixed to its side that provides emergency information about MH. It's critical that the MH cart be readily accessible to OR personnel. It should be secured to prevent borrowing of supplies, but never locked. When each member of the OR team does his or her job effectively, the MH crisis can be resolved within 30 minutes to an hour. The side effects of dantrolene include nausea, malaise, lightheadedness, and muscle weakness. That doesn't mean that danger has passed, however. Recrudescence occurs in 25% of MH cases. Patients should be monitored for 24 hours, and dantrolene should be continued for 24 to 48 hours. In PACU or ICU, the dosage is one milligram per kilogram every six hours. While the patient is in ICU, close attention will be paid to the patient's vital signs, as well as CK, ABGs, potassium, calcium, and urine myoglobin until all are normal. The patient should also be monitored for signs and symptoms of DIC during this post-op period. Also remember that MH can manifest for the first time post-operatively. M-House recommends monitoring vital signs every 15 minutes for at least an hour in PACU, followed by another hour of step-down monitoring. Follow-up with the patient and his family is also critical, since MH could manifest again the next time he has surgery. And there you have it, the story of Jake Andrews and the rare but serious condition that nearly took his life. During this video, you've learned about MH, its causes, symptoms, and treatments. An MH episode can be effectively treated with Revanto and a trained and alert medical staff. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have some other pressing matters to attend to.
Jake, is that a surgical video game? Yeah, Trauma Center. Let me see that. I should be fairly good at that game.